officially day 29. Uh, we are about to start day eight uh, of our ride and I will come back to that once I've introduced our guests. So um, so this morning I'm joined by Pete and, um, and JD and JD is a very good friend of ours and he's helped us with, um, with the virtual challenge um, just helped with the, the pulling together of all of the footage that I promise you'll see shortly once I, uh, once I fix that up. Um, but as a documentary filmmaker and speaker, Joel, uh, sorry, he's, um, Joel is the founder and chief storyteller at Stories in Motion, a boutique film production company. As a documentary filmmaker, commercial director and keynote speaker, Joel travels the world in the pursuit of human stories. He reflects on his own extraordinary journey that has touched the lives of 35 million people around the planet. Having been separated from his mother at five years of age, he was found at a busy market in Manila. Adopted at the age of six, life started again in a new country, Australia. 30 years later, he returned to Manila to find the answers to the lifelong question of his past. Starting with no clues, his quest to locate his biological parents in the country of millions captured the heart of the Philippines. Through guts, persistence, and the ability to seek help, this, his yearning to find his own identity was made possible by the warmth of the Filipino people. And as I said, JD's also helped us with this virtual ride challenge and, and helped with all of the editing of the footage. So thanks for joining us today, JD. I'm going to hand over to you and Pete and fix this footage. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, CT. Uh, morning, JD. How morning. are you this morning, mate? Good, mate. Good, good. I look, mate. I look like two pair of pants on and got my thermals yeah. out on the farm. Yeah, yeah. Nice and toasty. Yeah, yeah. nice and toasty, yeah. So it's a bit of a change. Uh, uh, we're not on the bike uh, this morning and uh, I'm not too sad about that. Although I do have to find uh, a further 25 Ks at some stage, but uh, having JD here with us in the, in the studio, also known as our house, uh, I thought it'd be nice to uh, uh, sit and have a, a nice, uh, nice uh, uh, interview and chat uh, by the fire. Um, the footage that uh, everyone's seeing, it's uh, something that uh, uh, you've seen uh, both in person live yeah. when you've been over there to yeah, help us yeah. uh, finish a ride. And it, it's actually, we got uh, a number of the riders from uh, the Doing Good Rewards ride uh, on this morning who were part of uh, the OYOB ride that we uh, that you came over with yeah, us and right. filmed, and uh, um, just a different name of the OYOB still there, but mm. uh, uh, and um, of course uh, uh, you've uh, travelled this leg on the road with us, and uh, you've done all the editing. So um, I hope you you're now seeing what this all looks like. Yes, yeah. it's, it's such a cool experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's really cool to see everything. Um, the whole format and just this whole virtual experience that we're all in at yeah. the moment. It's yeah. Interesting, huh? Mate, before we uh, get into your story, mm. I just wanted to um, acknowledge Mickey Campbell. Yeah. Uh, Mickey Campbell, we spoke to on uh, uh, Friday morning. And uh, for those that were on, you know that uh, the Mad Scotsman was heading out on a Saturday morning at uh, 6 a.m. He was starting. Uh, to ride, he was going to ride 800 kilometres uh, non-stop, um, albeit with a few transitions, along the M7, which is a motorway in west of Sydney. And, uh, um, and we were tracking his ride all over the weekend and he finished uh, 800 kilometres at 12.36 this morning. Wow. Uh, so a massive effort uh, uh, to Mickey to, to do that. I know it was bloody cold out there, but, uh, um, and his support crew was just amazing. So, uh, so all of those who are wondering how Mickey uh, went when we finished up on Saturday, uh, well, he finished. He finished at 12.36 this morning, 800 k. so an amazing story. Talking about amazing stories, JD, you've got one, and uh, uh, we're gonna share that this morning. Uh, I guess um, I'll jump all over the place uh, as I do, uh, but uh, growing up in, um, uh, in, in Australia, going to school, um, it's clear uh, since we've known each other that uh, art, performing, uh, the creative, it's, uh, it's core to your DNA. Mm. Uh, how did that manifest 
um, growing up? What did that look like for you? Mm. Um, well, I guess when I came here, um, when I first came to Australia, because I didn't have any English, um, I was really kind of relying on people's body language and, and those cues to sort of understand what people were sort of trying to tell me or, yep. or what they weren't from me. So I think from an early age, I had to rely on that first. Um, and I think movement was my first language. And, and I think it, it, it really is like, no matter, you know, no matter where you are and uh, or any Filipinos, like Filipinos are either dancers or singers yeah. or nurses. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and I, I fit it into the dance yeah. sort of um, pocket really, really nicely. Um, and yeah, I just, you know, I discovered Michael Jackson back in the day and just spent hours and hours in front of the television copying his moves. And, and then I said to mum, my adoptive mum, you know, I want to do dance classes and it just kind of went from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was, it was nice to, you know, cause you know, when you go to school and you have that experience, but when you actually go to a dance class where there's people who have chosen to go to dance, yeah, sure. it's, not, it's not a dance thing as a subject. Yeah. It's that was such a, a totally different um, experience. And I finally got to connect with people who really wanted, who really were passionate about dance and performance and, and the arts. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, and my adoptive mother was super supportive. So, you know, she helped me find a dance school, and that was where I lived for the next, you know, fifteen years of yeah. my life. Yeah. And you said that uh, as Filipinos, they either dance or sing. Yeah. Can you sing as well? I I, I sang when I was a kid. Yeah. But I, I didn't exercise. I didn't train that. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was more geared towards the dance. Yeah. Um, and, and what did, did the dance bring you that um, integration into the community that uh, you were looking for? Yeah, I, I think dance gave me that sense of belonging. Yeah. You know, um, you know, school was a whole different experience and I was just trying to understand, you know, just the, uh, trying, to, trying to learn school and trying to, um, and I was never really an academic person. Yeah. Um, I was always sort of itchy and, and I, I remember in school, like it, the minute I stopped and sat in the seat, I started to get really tired and would always be really tired in class. But as yeah. soon as I got up and started moving, I was wide awake. So, um, being dancing was a it, it helped me um, feeling like that. I felt like I belonged there. Yeah. Um, and it it kind of opened me up to yeah. a lot of things because. Because I still like, I always felt like I was behind with English. Yeah. Um, movement and expression was a way to express how I felt mm. without without language. Sometimes there's uh, a real pressure on kids, isn't there, to uh, to fit into a box, and mm. and a lot of it going through school is around uh, academia, and you've got to be at this level, mm. and you know we're testing kids all the time yeah. around where they're at, and there's this expectation because you're seven or you're nine or you're 13, that you've got to be doing this level math, this level English. Yeah. And, yeah. and we all grow and develop in different ways. And what you're saying there around the dance and the movement and so forth, mm. that was what was so good for your development. Yeah, yeah. And especially when the school that I went to, it was such a academic and sport oriented school. Yeah, right. You know, so football and cricket and swimming yeah. was such a big part of the culture there. Yeah. And, um, and then it's when I was when I was able to find a, a, a school that that I really connected with. It was that was where I and that's where I fitted. Yeah. And you know, being Filipino in an Australian culture. Yeah. It was um it was a bit of a conflict about yeah. whether you know do I do sport and I did a lot of sport yeah. growing up and I did athletics and I was quite an um, athletic person. Yeah. But I always found like I felt. I felt I was home in the dance year. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And when did you realise that it was something that there was a talent that uh, uh, was beyond just uh, busting out the moves to get you through uh, school and to and you, you had to have a, a tribe to hang out with? When did you realise that there was a, a talent that was uh, beyond just like what people like me or most people had, you know, yeah. something that was going to take you somewhere? I think the, the, the real pivotal experience for me was when uh, in 2000, when the sort of the first wave of international dancers came to Australia. Yeah. And it, 
was um, you know Sean Hurd, who was a, a big choreographer at the time. He choreographed Janet uh, Janet Jackson. Yeah, and I remember you know doing a workshop, and I was you know I was I kind of rediscovered dance when I was in my twenties, and and was was like, well, I, I want to dance now, and this is what I want to do. But it was it was when they came over and they they taught like a, just a different way of moving, yeah, a different way of um, listening to music, yeah, and it was such a, a musical um, like the whole class was it was wasn't just a dance studio it was like a music class mm. it was understanding music, um, and then there was like the intention behind what the music meant or um, how to execute something physically, yeah, um, but it was like teaching people how to listen to music was what really opened my ears and um it made me really curious about going over to the states and and i think that when i went to the states and then realized that oh actually i could i could kind of i'm dancing with one of the best yeah and picking up the same choreography and being picked to yeah. do groups it was like that was when i was like oh i, I could actually maybe make a, a career in, in dance yeah yeah you're, um, uh, we've had someone uh, else that we've chatted to who had some time on reality TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, you're not the first on this uh, <laughs> this chat, but yeah. so we spoke with Cam Merchant the other day, and mm. and uh, Cam, I don't think you'd mind me saying, uh, uh, I think you got there through talent, and uh, Cam got picked up sitting in a bar uh, yeah, for yeah. his show. Yeah. Uh, what did you appear on, and what was that like for you? So I appeared on So You Think You Can Dance and I, I came back from the States after trying to do, do the whole, you know, um, American dream dance in the States uh, thing. And, and uh, I heard that So You Think You Can Dance, the first season was coming to air in Australia. And it was something, that, it was a huge thing for the dance community. Yeah, yeah. Um, because back then, you know, when you said that you were a dancer, People were like, oh yeah, that's cool. What else do you do? Yeah, and so it was a it was a huge thing, and um, and I really wanted to be a part of it, and I was wanted to be I wanted to be a choreographer because I was I was sort of later in my dance career. I was like 20, 28. Yeah, right. Um, and that's in the dance industry. That's considered getting old. Yeah, you know. Um, but at that time, like, it wasn't such a sure thing. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to audition as a dancer and go back to the, you know, go back to being just a dancer and learning other people's styles. And um, it was a gru it was a grueling, it was a grueling experience. Like, so you think you can dance is not um, of any way a normal to the dance industry. It was like it was a heightened thing. It's 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 built around breaking news so that they get good drama for TV. Right, right, um, and. Gee, who would have thought that, that reality TV is about creating drama, yeah, JD, yeah, yeah. you know? So yeah. let's, let's move forward. Yeah, you, yeah. What I hear from you is mm. uh, uh, that you're drawn to the uh, choreography. Yeah. Which kind of yeah. uh, makes sense given what you do now. Yeah. It's around directing and producing and so forth. Mm. And, and um, then you found this uh, talent, which is absolutely amazing mm. in storytelling. And... Uh, from behind a camera. Mm. How did that come about for you? Well, it, it really opened up my eyes after, after So You Think. Um, and yeah. when, when I was, you know, booted off the, you know, when I was, when it was my yeah. time to go, uh, they showed a package. Did you say, was there a bit of you on TV saying, I'm not ready to go yet, <laughs> my time's not up? <laughs> because that's the standard line, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, well, I, it, it, I was crying for more than I like <laughs> than I liked on the show. It was it was really intense. Yeah, yeah. But um, it was it was at the end when they show that package. Then when they show you your journey throughout yeah. the whole the whole experience, and that that just something shifted. You know, like you know um, when you see when you see yourself um, from the outside looking yeah. in, and you, you see where you've come from, and when you, and you see where you where you are now, yeah. and how far you've come. It, it's it's a real it's a real powerful experience, you know, and I don't know if you experienced that when you made your story. Yeah. It's like when you looked at yourself and went, oh, wow, this is where, I've, you know, this is where I've come from and, and seeing where you are now going, like what was involved in getting to that point. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a real, it's a real powerful experience to, yeah. for your story to be told. And I, that, that experience just never left me. 
Yeah. And it's, it's and it's experience that I love. I love giving to people. You know, yeah. when, they, when they come to me and they say, "Hey, I've got an idea. Or I've got an event, or I've, you know, what I need a, a story made on my business." And um, when they see that, you know, and, and you know, when we when we when we made your wedding, mm. you know, it's it's a it's a real it's a filmmaker's sort of um, purpose is to like move people through storytelling. Yeah, I think though, you know, JD, like there's uh, uh, there's a real difference in in telling a story and then really capturing s uh, the depth and essence of you know what you do. And we had uh, Steve Pawlowski uh, on, who's a storyteller of almost a similar ilk, and um, you know he's he's it just stands out. You know the way that. Uh, you can reach in because there's so many people who can capture something from behind a camera, isn't it? Yeah. And there's the ability to tell a story. And, yeah. and that's, that's what took us to Thailand. Mm. Um, you came over and um, we're recording uh, some of the work of hands and uh, uh, we went to um, Ban Home Hug, um, uh, and one of the homes that we support up in Yossetan and, and, uh, uh, you, you were interacting with the kids. You were dancing for the kids, yeah, and yeah. they were busting out their yeah, moves. And they were really good, dude. Yeah, I, I, I was, were. I was sweating. I was like, I, I... the old man had to <laughs> uh, had to perform, yeah, and the no. kids were right. Uh, yeah, but it was there was a there was something special. Yeah, happened up there um, at the home, and um, what was that? Yeah. So, man, the minute we went into that. Uh, home hug, you know, the kids were all oil all of the cameras and um, you know, we were trying to work and but this 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 little kid grabbed my hand and he took me to to uh, where he slept and was reading a book and it was such a powerful experience um, sitting there next to this orphan and realizing that this this little kid was was me, you know, mm. this uh, we had come from the same kind of background. Um and I never forget that he was such a, you know, like when, when we first worked together, it was like, man, there's, there's something, there's something mm. going on. Something's going to happen. Something deep is going to happen than just making a, mm. you know, making a film. Mm. Um, and that's such a real powerful experience. And that was a, that was really the catalyst for me to really um, investigate and, and explore, re-explore my own story. Yeah. After sort of, you know, closing the lid on it for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. You know? And because it was so traumatic, um, I had to just really focus on moving forward and, you know, I couldn't sort of just sit in that sort of grief mm. all, all my life. So, mm. and, it, and it reappeared its head at like a few times in my life. But, you know, there's these little signs in your life that, that, that are just, um, that are too, that are too um, powerful to ignore. Mm. Um, and that powerful moment was with that orphan at home hug and and just looking into his eyes and just seeing literally seeing a reflection of myself it was he was a that reminder of like okay now it's time to go home yeah you know yeah yeah and it's you know there's, there's so many people in my life that have come in and given me a an idea or a hint or a push or a nudge of, or something and um yeah it was uh it was a remarkable experience and and it's an experience that um, I think a lot of people can relate to doing or being a part of hands. They, they get their, their life changes somehow, mm. um, whether it's just more perspective or um, whether it's, you know, taking on a task they think is, is yeah. going to be impossible, which was what I took on, you know? Mm. Um, and um, yeah, just, and, and it wasn't just that moment. It was just that spending time Mm. You know, spending time at the orphanage, yeah, and really kind of taking everything in, and, and everything that I saw at Home Hug was pretty much the same thing that I saw in my own orphanage. Yeah, you yeah. Know, all the clothes, all the shoes, you know, all the kids, um, all the beds, you know, all the carers. Um, it was just like a, a a different version of my my own home, and yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that experience. It, um, and, and it, you know, it obviously speaks to you talk about what people take from hands, and mm -hmm. and I guess hands is in some way the conduit, though. Yeah. You know, it's either you're ready for this change or the change comes, but mm -hmm. you have to be open uh, to accepting uh, that change, no matter what that change is. So, um, 
you know, you talk about the similarities and so forth. And, and I guess the difference for um, like your story, which I'll get you to share, mm. and our kids at Home Hug mm. is that um, uh, for many of them, uh, they've, their parents have been lost as in uh, they've passed away. And uh, particularly at Home Hub, where we have the kids who uh, so many have HIV or have lost their parents to HIV and their parents may have been in the, uh, the sex trade or so forth. And, and many years ago, I've been trafficked and contracted of the virus. And mm -hmm. we have the government, we have the police, we have the hospitals who bring the kids to us. And uh, uh, so your, your story uh, was very different. You weren't given up. You didn't have parents that didn't uh, uh, have the capacity to care for you. The, you didn't, you know, it's, uh, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my, my story starts uh, when I was five and I woke up one morning and my mother wasn't in the house. And as a, as a kid, it's, you know, the first thing you do is say, mom, where are you? I'm hungry. Yeah. And she wasn't in the house. And, and it, I walked out of the house thinking I'd find her just out in the street, but then I kept walking and kept walking and and then I realized I didn't know how to get back. Yeah. And um, I ended up at a market and that was where I was found. Um, so for a lot of the kids at Home Hog, you know, they, you know, their parents have passed and they've been able to accept that and they've been able to grieve through yeah. that and they've been able to have people around them of their culture yeah. that, that helps them be able to reestablish their, you know, life and, and moving on. And, um, but for me, you know, I was lived in an orphanage for a couple of years and then I was adopted out to an Australian couple. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, initially it was really tough. Yeah. Know, really tough because, you know, it's not like my part, my, my parents passed. It was like, you know, I, I walked off, which yeah. then I felt like that it was my fault. So I kind yeah. of held that on, held, held on to that for yeah. my life. And then the not knowing is, I think, is the uncertainty and the not knowing what, what happened. Yeah. Um, of you know, where was my mom in the yeah. morning? Uh, why wasn't she there? Um, and then also, you know, why why wasn't she able to find me in the yeah. orphanage? Um, and again, that's the, there's a real difference there too in the you know, what you're having to resolve and deal with yourself. Again, our kids, and many of them um, throughout the, all the properties, there will be family uh, that we know, yeah. that they know, but yeah. for different reasons, they're not able to take care of them right now. And what that allows is, you know, during school holidays or at different times, they, they spend time with the family, but it might be the case that it's an elderly grandparent or so forth is their sole family member and that fat, that grandparent can't take care of them, but they still spend time with mm. them. And, and sometimes the kids in our homes are there uh, for a short time to help while the, the, the parents or the mum or the dad is getting themselves sorted out medically or they might have been in prison or whatever. And, and they're with us, but they know that that connection and yours was... It's such a different circumstance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're, you're, the the kids there, you know, they they remain connected to their culture. Mm. You know, so you know, I think what people don't realise is that when someone is adopted from a different country, that's just the complexities of yeah cultural it's, um, um, complexes of um, belonging and and being reflected in in yeah. the people around them. Um, and that was just a it was a huge experience just going back to the Philippines again and real and like feeling and being reflected in every single person on the street yeah you know which you know initially when i got there it was a bit of a uh it was a challenge because it was like you know anyone could have been my dad or my mom yeah you know yeah. so it was like i was always like alert going that could be my dad or that yeah. could be my mom how old were you when, when you went back and started the search i was 35 it was about three three and a half years ago yeah 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 um, and it was, yeah, it was after about a year after we did the hands yeah. project and, um, and you turned that around really quickly, didn't you? You know, like it was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah you had this experience at home hug and yeah. then you went, okay, the time is right. Yeah. And it was like, uh, everything I've seen you do JD, whether it's, uh, it would dance or, or 
you know, film or telling stories. It's you, you embrace it and you do it so exceptionally well. <laughs> I go see how you've mastered riding on that scooter thing <laughs> while you're filming, you know, or, or, you know, learning to fly your drone. It's just, you go, okay, I'm going to do this. And you just do it well. And no surprise then that you go to a country with, uh, uh, how many people in Manila? It's 100 million. 100 mi million in the Philippines. Yeah. And you go, yeah, of course, I'm going to find the mum. You know, she's my mum. And this is what I do when I yeah. commit to something, I yeah. succeed. And, yeah. and um, you kind of uh, put everything uh, in your life on hold, didn't you? Mm. You know, work stops, uh, uh, personal. Um, with your relationship at the time, it yeah. was like, I've got to go. Yeah. And you went. And that was tough. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was really tough. Yeah. We're just joined by Bert and me. Good morning, Bert. Yeah. And uh, you go and um, step us through what that was like to start with. Mm. What, how, how much, uh, um, uh, I, I guess, hope did you have and, mm. and realism about, you know, well, is this a one in a? Hundred million shot here that I've got. Yeah. Or what yeah. were you feeling and thinking? Well, I, I I went over there with the expectation of not, you know, of not finding her, but I, I wanted to, I just wanted to reconnect with my culture. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do everything that I could to to, you know, to follow up anything that might have, you know, slipped behind the cracks as far as paperwork wise or yeah, if there's sure. any, if there's anyone that I could talk to, um, maybe find a sibling or something. Um, but I knew deep down and what, what I was led to believe was that it was impossible. Mm. Um, but I, I knew that one of the, one of the ways was trying to connect with the media over there. Yeah. Um, and because I was a storyteller and a filmmaker, I was, I was at the minute I landed, um, I was filming. Yeah. And then, even before I went over there, I was sort of doing interviews with yeah. my mom, just going, how do you feel? And, all yeah, that yeah. and stuff. So I was playing the subject and the director at the same time, which was, was a real challenge. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think, you know what, like the dance experience kind of, it, it created the resilience mm. um, that I needed um, as far as rejection, because it was like yeah, contacting sure. the, the networks and they were like, no, we're too busy, we're too busy, yeah. we're too busy. Um, and though, so it was like, you know, what my, what my mom taught me was, you know, if you want to, if you want to do something, you do it yourself. Mm. Um, so I did my own kind of search and I basically just spent a lot of time at the market where I was, where I was found. Yeah. And some miraculous sort of way we found a couple that had lost a child back at the sort of around about the same time that I was lost. Yeah. And so we went through this whole process of DNA tests and getting to know their family and trying to like, you know, being a private investigator. Yeah. And figuring out and connecting the dots. And unfortunately that whole experience, um, you know, came to an end when we got the DNA test back. Yeah. And it came out negative, but that kind of, um, created a bit of a, a, a bit of a, um, bit of a, push for the network to to help um, yeah because I had shown a lot of my own work and and because I was a filmmaker I provided a lot of footage for them so for them it was easy for them production wise yeah. to, to make a story um, and that was when that the first lead of my mum sort of happened and it's someone in Japan who was living in the house that I walked off from um, recognized me yeah and that was just that was, you know, you, you, we, I wasn't able to get that, you know, be able to achieve that if I wasn't a storyteller. Yeah. You know? Um, you talk about something, I'm just going to throw a log on the fly. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, well, it's not a, it's not a, t it's not a studio set, it's actually a real fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk about something there, which I think uh, uh, really, really stood out as a powerful, um, experience and powerful skill and uh, that of rejection yeah and uh, yeah. the strength that that created and yeah it made me think you you related it to, to dance and the more dance uh, you do uh, the more rejection you're going to get yeah you don't get success in that industry without rejection yeah. and uh, 
and and I wonder like how many people go through their professional life and mm. and have the level of rejection, but with that comes strength. Yeah, well, I mean, like the you can you can if you speak to anyone in the arts, they, yeah. they they'll have a very, very intimate connection with rejection. Yeah, you know, it's just part of the job. You know, like actors and you know, like when we when we're talking acting wise, like you know, auditioning is is like that's the job the yeah. job is not getting the job and doing the paid work yeah the auditioning is the job you know yeah. and the rejection is the job yeah you know? um and it's and it's a constant battle of like really wanting something and yeah. knowing that it's like you just have to settle you just have to just do what you need to do yeah and if if it's your time it's your time yeah yeah and um yeah got a, a good decade couple decades worth of rejection yeah and, yeah that's yeah. that's a it's obviously built the resolve, you know, and yeah. uh, built the strength to uh, have no, have a no and go again, and yeah. have another no and go again and keep going. And yeah. so, what did it feel like? You you went there in your own words, and uh, that you went there to complete a story uh, and and connect with your culture, mm. not without the expectation of finding mm. your parents. Mm. But obviously that changes when you're starting to uh, uh, get DNA uh, taken and there's enough there for you to think this could be, this could be, yeah, this could be, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you, you built this resolve of projection, but what was that like when you get the results back? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's that, um, it's that awful feeling of having to start again, you yeah. know, of, of working for something and you've worked so hard for something. Yeah. And then, you know, just a, a simple test or a phone call is just like, ah, uh, you know, like mm. you, you have to go into, you have to go back to this, the start mm. um, of a journey. Um, I think for me, because, because I had done a lot of work prior to that, like a lot of counseling and a lot of support, um, around what those what the emotional um milestones will be and, and how to prepare for them you know i was prepared for that and obviously with the dance kind of yeah. career i was prepared for that but i think what i felt really was for um the the couple that thought that i was yeah sure you know, thought that i was yeah. their their son and, and the whole family you know mm. and and having to be on the other side of of saying it wasn't it wasn't the right fit to someone yeah. else, you know, and, and having seen them um, seeing the disappointment yeah. um, in their faces, and yeah, and then it also to me it was like, well, you know, because we're all talking about it, we're, we're going to be family, every, you know, no matter what, and, and then I'm like, well, are we still family, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it, it, I really felt for the couple um, and the family when that DNA test came back. Yeah. Um, because for them, you know, it was like, for them, when that key went missing, it kind of, it really broke apart the family. Yeah. So when I came, all of them from all different parts of Manila all came together for the first time after 30 years, mm. because that, the key that went, went missing really rocked their whole uh, family structure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough. It was really tough. And of course you've got some, um you know, your adopted family back in Australia who yeah. were uh, on this journey and only they would know what that was like for them mm -hmm. to, uh, um, to be going through that for you <clears throat> in, in you, you know, being on that journey and then seeing again uh, a, a rejection or, uh, or I guess not completing the circle rather than a rejection for, from the DNA results. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you take that hit, you take that loss yeah. and you just get back up mm. and you go again. Yeah. And uh, what, what period of time was this uh, occurring over from when you first landed mm. in Manila uh, to when you, you know, you've got the DNA back, it says no, um, you dust yourself off and you just keep going. What period of time are we talking about? So I, I found my, the first lead in about a month. Yeah. Um, and that was when I found the first family. Mm -hmm. And then we had to wait, because we had to send oh. over the DNA test overseas, we had yeah. to wait like grueling 20 days. Um, but within that 20 days, I was, you know, doing more research and um, 
because I, I had found this family, but then I, I was, you know, I wanted to do, keep going and just, because if it wasn't, if it wasn't this family, I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything that I can while I was there because I took three months off my business yeah. to, to be there. Um, and then the DNA test came back. So that was about two months. And then I did another month with the support of the network. And when they were on board, yeah. um, you know, helping me kind of get, get around and, and helping me with translators and helping me with film crews. Because I, before then I was basically paying for a local film crew to follow me yeah. for the whole trip. So yeah. having them sort of do that kind of leg of the work as well really helped me as well. Cause I, like I, I ran out, I was running out of money. Yeah, fast. yeah. I, you know, people think Asian countries are cheap. Philippines wasn't cheap. Yeah. You know, if you want to stay in a place that's, you know, safe and, mm. and I didn't have any Filipino ties, so I couldn't stay with anyone. So, um, well, you did, you just hadn't found them yet. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, so the, the, the search, the pursuit uh, continues. Mm. Uh, then there's uh, uh, something happens where it brings you uh, to where we are today. Mm. Um, talk us through uh, what it was that led to the finding at Needle in a Haystack, mm. uh, mm. which was your mum. Well, I think I think what really um, because there was there was a couple of stories or a couple of episodes that came out in the Philippines and um, and by then we were th I was thinking that maybe she knew that I was looking for her but maybe she was you know for yeah. whatever reason she didn't want to come forward yeah and um, and I think it was like two days before I had to leave and um, I was able to luckily I was able to get on a, a really big uh, radio show of prime time yeah. which was very unheard of yeah um, and Mike, who's um, the vice president of GMA in the Philippines, the network, he heard the story and um, wanted to help me because he knew that I was leaving. Yeah. And I, yeah, when I got onto radio and did an announcement on prime time, shortly after, someone called in and said that, um, you know, that we know who this is and mm. we know who the mum is. Mm. Um, and uh, it was an interesting phone call. It was, you know, I was in the car uh, outside a cemetery. Um, I was was there for about a couple of weeks because someone had said that they had spotted my mum there. Mm. So I was day and night. I was in that cemetery, which is a cemetery where people actually live. There's villages and actually, you know, it's one of the biggest cemeteries in the Philippines. Um, and it, when you go in there, there's graves, but it also looks like just a normal, you know, a normal village in the yeah. Philippines. And I got that phone call in the car and, you know, and the producer was very, cause we had gone through the similar, uh, the similar thing. So he yeah, was very, yeah. he was very, he was very cautious of like, you yeah. know, maintaining expectations. And, but I think deep down he knew because, you know, she verified everything because the producer goes and verifies first yeah. before they do a meet up. And then, then, then he said, oh, you know, she, she wants to meet you. Um, at the market where you got lost mm. and um and also her name because we were looking for a, a person called linda mm. and and he and he said you know the producer said you know her name's not linda that's her nickname but her, her real name is herminia um so all this new information because every day was new information yeah you yeah. know every day was just something a lead or you know something that we had to follow up and, and then yeah i was I, we met we met at the market, um, around about midday, um, there was a ton of people around. Um, it was just such a surreal moment to think that this was the place that I got lost. Mm. And now this is the place I'm going to meet my biological mum. Mm. And when you see the footage, it's, you know, like, I, you know, like I was awkward. Yeah. You know, I was awkward. I was, um, I was tentative, you know, mm. I just didn't want to, mm. you know, really let myself go because I did, unless I knew this was, this was the one. Yeah. And, um, and then she just, she came to me and then she just, she just gave me photos straight away. And, um, it's a remarkable thing to, to see yourself as a kid when you've never had any documentation mm. prior to 
an orphanage, you know, mm. prior to that, the mm. first photo that was taken in an orphanage. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw, a, I saw a couple of photos when I was two or three and, um, yeah, it's such a moving experience to, yeah. to see yourself finally, you know, I was able to finally reconnect the dots and mm. realize that I'm, you know, that I, that I did, that I did exist. Yeah. That, that my mom did love me and found yeah. out what had happened. And, um, but yeah, when I, when I, so we had met a few, a few people from the house that lived with my mom and when they sort of nodded and said, that's her. Yeah. That was when I had to, that's when I really let go. And yeah. And I was a mess at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just, mm-hmm. yeah. Holding my mom for, you know, that I'd missed in the 30 years. It's a, um, uh, it's an amazing story and it's something having uh, seen uh, uh, the, 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 that moment in time where you get to hug your mum and uh, and I think everyone would understand why mm. there was that awkwardness and so forth mm. and mm. without understanding your feelings that the, the, the concept of feeling awkward makes sense but it's mm. a it's a beautiful uh, moment um, and uh, uh, many have seen it because it was uh, the story was told uh, on 60 Minutes uh, mm. here in Australia, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and did that, what did that mean for you to then, um, like I was fortunate to be at your house when mm. uh, uh, that story was shown on 60 Minutes, but, you know, having your story on uh, such a, a prime uh, a show here in Australia, what did that, did that mean a lot to you? Was it, uh, a reflection on seeing the pictures there. What what was that like? Yeah, well, I guess it's that kind of same experience again when I on the dance show when yeah you know when I finished up and there was like the the, the journey and yeah and it, again it's that that um, seeing yourself you know objectively from the outside looking in and going wow yeah you know I've come from my life could have been you know growing up in the Philippines and one, just one, one, one little thing that I did when I was a kid yeah. totally changed my life. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and having been there for such a long time and, and literally seeing different versions of me yeah. in the Philippines and looking at, at how, at how I've evolved and, how, and where I've come from and where I am now. It was, a, it was a huge experience. It was a real powerful experience that, that just keeps reiterating that how one how powerful storytelling is, mm. um, but also to just um, you know the just I guess the resilience that that a lot of that, that you know you you seen like in Thailand like mm. Yeah, mm. you know like they, they're just so resilient you know like it's yeah. like life is like life is on a very different level in 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 those countries yeah um the the kind of problems they have on a day-to-day is very different to the kind of yeah. problems we have here and so you know just seeing the resilience of filipinos you really get to understand that like we've, we've got a pretty pretty lucky here yeah yeah for sure yeah. oh absolutely no yeah. question about that you your mum comes out to Australia and yeah. uh, there's the meeting of um, your adoptive mum and your natural yeah. um, birth mum and, and um, um, you travel to the States, you spend time with your dad and yeah. you've got uh, a, a family spread across the globe. Yeah. Um, finding your, your mum, finding your dad. Um, did it bring uh, a calmness and peace uh, to you? It did. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It really did. Um, I think the just knowing where you come from. Yeah. Um, knowing your roots. Um, it it really it it really shapes it really shapes you and and before that I didn't have that and my, and I think that like it's probably what really drew me to storytelling in the first place. Yeah. You know? Um, this the not knowing my own story probably had that 
the sort of the interest in other people's stories. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you know, over the last few years now, you know, having my adoptive mum meet my biological mum, that mm. was a gift. And that was a gift that that was given through, you know, doing that story with 60 Minutes. And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, 60 Minutes, this and that. But like, they really supported me in yeah. the whole process of going yeah. back. And because after I'd come back, I was like, I was exhausted. And then I was sort of picking up the pieces of my business, trying to restart yeah. my business. Yeah. You know? So, you know, being away do business for a long period of time, kind of, you feel it over the next couple of years, yeah. you know? Um, and then seeing my dad um, in the States and and just being there, thinking that, you know, 10 years ago, I was there trying to be a dancer and, you know, yeah, not, yeah. And not knowing that my, my biological dad yeah, yeah. was in the States, you know, yeah. in, in, in California. Um, yeah, it's, it's been an incredible, incredible journey, but it's, it's, it's been about these really precious gifts that have mm. been given along the way. Yeah. That's come through you know, doing what I, you know, doing what I'm passionate about and doing what I love. And that's, and that's that for me, you know, when I rang you up, you know, in like a couple of, about a month ago about like, what can I do? You know, mm. it, was, it was, it's like storytelling is, it for me is, is, is an act of service, yeah. you know, as a storyteller, you know, with it, with, whether you're in a family, you know, if you're the storyteller, that's, that's, that's your job. Yeah. You know, it's to capture everyone's story and to, um, so that's how I feel like I can, you know, be of service and yeah. um, contribute to whatever cause I feel passionate about. And you do it so well. Uh, and it's, we started this this uh, chat around that, and um, and it was interesting when we very first met at Narrabeen, where you came to yeah. to uh, put a few <laughs> pieces together yeah. and uh, stories in motion uh, as a company, and it was always about telling stories about someone that had a, their own story and a cause and there was had to be something a bit with greater purpose behind yeah. it. And yeah. you do that so beautifully, mate. And um, so many valuable lessons there. And for me, I, I go never tire of hearing the story or watching the story unfold and, uh, um, you know, hearing you talk about the power of rejection and, uh, mm and the commitment to, to something you honestly believe in and, and the pursuit of what you're after. And, um, you know, you, you deserve so much uh, peace and happiness. And uh, uh, thanks for sharing the, the journey with us this morning and uh, yeah, bringing, bringing hands yeah. to life in the way that you do. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful gift to give so many, mate. And uh, may you continue to do that. So. Uh, you're a good fella. Thanks, Thanks brother. Mate. Yeah. What we'll do is, um, uh, JD's got some amazing uh, um, uh, assets around what he's done uh, from a, a professional mm -hmm. sense, and we'll put some links up there where you can have a look at the the trailer. He's working on a much bigger project around uh, the story uh, of his life, and uh, uh, so jump on, have a look for that. It's been a, a wonderful chat. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, not sweating my way through uh, through an interview. Uh, so I'm going to hand back to CT to wrap us up uh, for uh, the uh, penultimate day. Have a good day, guys. See you guys. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, and uh, I guess just before we let you jump off, um, you would have seen on the footage there, we've just ridden into um, a pretty significant place on the, on the hands journey. Um, so we've just finished riding and we've finished at um, Wat Yan Yao. And, and I think it would, um, it would be remiss of us not to talk about that um, just quickly. So I might just hand back to Pete, <laughs> who can just share the significance of where we've just finished. Yeah, thanks CT, how about that? I was so uh, captured in the story. Uh, I think I looked at the video footage once and uh, um, and I didn't even see that we would have uh, climbed the mountain and descended the mountain and uh, Wat Yan Yao is certainly a significant place and um, um, it's a temple where uh, three and a half thousand bodies uh, were taken from the tsunami. Um, it's a location where uh, parents uh, uh, spent time searching 
uh, for their kids and local Thai families. And, and it was ground zero for us in Thailand, I guess. Um, I arrived at that temple and walked in through the gates and all I could see was decomposing bodies of, of thousands of people. And I would meet families there and, and uh, who were searching for their, their loved ones, be it international or Thai nationals. And, you know, it's interesting, JD, you talk about spending time in the US where your dad was there. And, and what I come, came to learn was that I was uh, at Wat Yan Yao at the same time as uh, what would become some of our staff from Bantam Nam Chai, um, uh, who a lady, uh, uh, Nong, who had lost her husband, lost her three kids, and she was walking and searching in um, Wat Yan Yao when I was there. But of course, it was something that we'd only meet um, years later. But a hugely significant place. It's where we, uh, where we all but finish um, our ride and uh, we spend uh, some time reflecting on, on uh, the journey uh, when we ride in Thailand at Wat Yan Yao and um, a very fitting that we uh, have that uh, today with a chat with you. So uh, thanks CT for uh, bringing that forward because as I said, I didn't even know where we were on the road today. So thanks. Thank you so much. It's, um, um, I think every, everyone has stayed on to, to just listen to that. So make sure you log a few extra Ks when you, um, when you log your Ks. Um, but yeah, what a beautiful chat and a great way to start Monday. Um, there's just some amazing comments that have come through um, for you, JD, and, and just such an inspiration. We've actually got Irene um, on the call who she's in the Philippines. Um, so she's, uh, she probably knows your face from, uh, from the TV and the radio and, um, yeah, so thank you both. Now, um, we've got a couple of great days coming up. So later today at 12 o'clock, we'll be joined by Sarah Davis, um, who's going to share her awesome story about, um, paddling the length of the Nile. Um, so another, you know, beautiful adventurer and an amazing story there. And then, um, and then tomorrow, it's our last day. Um, so we've got a few things happening tomorrow. We've still got our seven o'clock Zoom. Uh, so Pete and myself will be interviewed by one of our riders tomorrow. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and then we will ride into BTN at 12 noon. Um, so we'll be able to see the kids and actually ride in and um, and say hello to them. And then tomorrow night um, at six o'clock, we're gonna have a celebration drink. So if you are around and you fancy coming on and saying hello, all of the kids are gonna be on the call. So they're, they're gonna, they're working through some activities and, and, um, and so they'll be there six o'clock tomorrow night. So plenty happening, check your email, jump into Facebook for all of the links and we'll see you at some point tomorrow. Enjoy your riding guys. Bye everyone.